Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Jenny Hornick and I'm the Digital Marketing Coordinator here at JMIR Publications. I'm very excited to welcome you all to today's webinar in collaboration with the Society of Digital Psychiatry and JMIR Mental Health. So as you all know, today's topic is social media and the internet, pathways to psychiatric care for young adults. So I'm gonna pass things on to the panel in just a moment, but before I do, we'll just go over a couple of housekeeping items. So firstly, just so everyone's aware, all of your microphones are going to be muted for the duration of the webinar, but to, we do encourage that you ask questions to the panel. So to do so, you can just use the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. And then towards the end of the webinar, the panelists will have a chance to get to those questions. Secondly, we are recording this event and we will be posting it later on on our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to view it later. And that's all I have for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass things over to Dr. John Torres. So Dr. Torres is the director of the Digital Psychiatry Division in the Department of Psychiatry at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, which is an affiliated teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. He's also the editor in chief of J.M. Meyer Mental Health. So I will go ahead and pass things over to John to kick things off. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you to JMIR for hosting this. I think today's guest is very exciting given how timely this topic is in the news. So Dr. Michael Birnbaum has done some fantastic work we'll talk about looking at social media and mental health. So he's a psychiatrist. Until recently, he was actually running the program for early treatment for early course schizophrenia at Northwell Health in New York and doing a lot of very interesting research on using social media platforms in that treatment and to recruit patients. Recently, he made a switch over and is now a medical director of early psychosis services for the state of New York and the New York State Psychiatric Institute, as well as an assistant investigator at Columbia University. And many of you have seen his papers in JMIR and other journals, really kind of taking a deep scientific dive into what can we actually use social media for to help advance our patients' care? So, Michael, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm excited to be here. And I think many of us may have seen in the U.S. news, at least, last week, the Surgeon General said he's thinking of putting a label on social media, almost like tobacco that says this is dangerous, it's harmful for your health. Is that a good thing, bad thing? Can we support it? It's hard to know how that's going to play out. And it's hard to know the impact that that might have on young people and other folks who are using social media on a regular basis or are thinking about uh, starting a social media site. Um, I do think we need more thought and regulation and, of course, uh, additional research so that we can understand both the risks and benefits associated with social media. But what we know for sure is that there is a very complex relationship between social media use and mental health. Um, and it's hard to boil it down to one black box warning uh, about the potential harms, um, especially because we don't necessarily, uh, we, it's, it's, it's too soon to confirm. I think that there, there certainly isn't um, universal consensus amongst the field with regards to uh, the, the risks of social media use and the benefits of social media use. And this is an evolving process. Yeah, I think that's well put. I think we can all imagine some people we seen it's harmful for, some people we've seen it's beneficial for, and a lot of people, maybe it's like air or water. It's just something you swim through or go through, and it, it doesn't make a large difference either way in terms of it. When you were at Northwell Health until recently, you were leading up the early treatment program, which is for people with first episode or early diagnosis of schizophrenia. You were finding interesting ways to study and use social media. Can you tell us what, what was your pioneering work in that space for people less familiar? Sure. What we saw there initially was that the young folks that we were working with who had early psychosis were using social media just like the rest of us. And so we started to think about ways that we can use social media for good and how we can leverage the benefits of social media and the popularity of social media uh, and the stickiness of social media to create something that would improve some of the challenges or address some of the challenges in early psychosis. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in early psychosis intervention is the lengthy 
amount of time between symptom onset and receiving appropriate care. And that became an area of focus for us. Uh, we were asking ourselves where these young folks were when they were not in our office, uh, when symptoms were bubbling up. And the answer inevitably was online, on social media. And so we started to play around with different strategies to understand how we could, how, how young folks are already util utilizing social media during that time, and how we as clinicians can benefit from that uh, in order to identify and engage young folks with the goal of bringing them into the office as soon as possible if they needed that. I think I did 2024 Pew statistics that at least over half of youth say they're constantly on online now. So, so again, it is that they can only be in the office so much, even if it's 30 minutes a week, which is a lot of care, but there's 99.9% .9 of the time you, youth are going to be online. So yeah. realizing constantly. that's where... Oh, so I was going to say constantly online, and then in addition to that, that the the, the that same uh, that same article I believe also mentioned that there is a good chunk of youth who are using social media to obtain mental health related information, and that's where this research lives. I, I think that we're that's a good start, but we have a very long way to go, especially if we want young folks to access high quality information. Uh, and to be able to measure the impact of the information that they get. But along those lines, we have data to suggest that young folks who come into the emergency room are obtaining their mental health information from TikTok. Uh, so so this, is, this is common and this is growing and this is a real challenge and also a real opportunity for us to present better information, uh, more useful information uh, and opportunities to navigate a very, very challenging question that many young people go through and often they don't know where to go for help, how to take that next step, uh, or what the typical trajectory of help seeking looks like. And so that's something that we can use social media to address. And what were some of the campaigns that you did? So you said youth are going to be online, we're going to find them first, early treatment matters, we'll find them online. So how did you engage or work with the online space? We, we started with collaborating uh, with folks who knew this space better than we did. Uh, and we built a digital media campaign, sort of the same way that advertisers um, routinely advertise for products, we tried to create a digital media campaign for early psychosis intervention. And we created a variety of digital ads that were placed online, um, predominantly on social media, Instagram and Facebook. And when people would click on our ad, they'd be brought to our landing page where we offered them a menu of opportunities to engage with us in a variety of different ways. For example, they can test, text, excuse me, with a peer navigator, they could advance to uh, a remote clinical assessment. Uh, and for folks who were eligible and interested, we'd be able to refer them to care. That was the goal. And this was, uh, this was expanded to New York State in its entirety. Uh, to encourage young folks who were searching for help to get help to get help uh, as soon as possible. And of course, the needle in the haystack, the, the folks that we were most interested in were uh, individuals uh, with emerging psychosis. Yeah. But as you said, you would you could reach anyone too, right? It could be depression, it could be early bipolar, it could be psychosis. It's everyone is on the internet, it sounds like. Yeah, and that was a real <laughs> challenge for us to find, uh, to see if we can find a sweet spot. And it still is a challenge to, to, to think through how big of a net we want and need in order to identify the people that we're looking for. What we learned, of course, is that there are so many young people out there who are looking for help online. And we ended up identifying and engaging a number of youth who had other psychiatric conditions who were coming through the funnel and asking for help. Um, and we ended up referring several of them to care. Uh, in fact, we were more likely to identify those folks, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, than individuals with early psychosis. Yeah, because I think we know early psychosis or maybe 1% of the population will say develop schizophrenia. Conditions like depression, anxiety are so prevalent that you're, you have to be able to serve everyone if you're looking for even a small population there. I think I'm looking, it was in 2020, you published a paper utilizing machine learning on internet search activity to support the diagnostic process and relapse detection in individuals of early psychosis. 
So how are you putting machine learning into these different parts as well? Because that is one way to sort through a lot of information. Yeah, so, so that is another arm of this research. And uh, we haven't yet combined the two, but that is certainly a, a plan uh, for, for, for down the road and next steps. But what we've done there is over the past several years, we've been collaborating with a variety of computer scientists and extracting social media archives, account histories from TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. We've also done search histories. So we have quite a few histories from Google. Uh, and now we've accumulated a, a pretty large um, data set of, of archives over the past several years across several hundred participants uh, with early psychosis and mood disorders and healthy individuals. And we've been using machine learning to see if we could identify patterns that are associated with illness emergence. So similarly, the question about shortening the duration of untreated psychosis, we're asking, well, what does that look like on the pages of Facebook and TikTok and Instagram and how does one online, how does their online universe and behavior and activity and their language, how does that change as symptoms emerge uh, and symptoms escalate often to the point of needing a hospitalization? So it's fantastic. You're saying we have people there waiting, for, looking for help online, maybe going to TikTok. We have potentially data that gives early clues about it. And if we almost can combine the two, it sounds like it would be a very powerful way to kind of help early diagnose and treat people yes in theory however a gigantic barrier that we haven't yet discussed is an individual's desire and interest in advancing to care and and that has been um a, a, a real dilemma and challenge because we've identified a lot of people online uh, we know that we could make fairly accurate predictions using social media activity uh, and other online digital data. And yet the majority of the folks that we talk to online tell us that they're only interested in information, that they're not interested in advancing to care. Um, and many of them have expressed reasons for not wanting to advance. W one of the saddest ones that we came across was with adolescents in particular who said that they didn't want to disclose the fact that they were struggling with psychiatric concerns and questions to their parents and primary uh, caregivers. And that was a real impediment to advancing. And so this has led to this next phase of our reach, research, which we will be launching uh, in the very near future. This is intended to be larger than New York State will be working uh, in approximately 17 states throughout the U.S., but the goal is to help, or I should say, develop and test advancement strategies that help people along this funnel uh, to get them from online help seeking to texting and then to an assessment and ultimately to care if if uh, if they need it. So we think that we can do it. We know that there. Uh, we know that there are ways that we could manipulate the online environment that could impact help seeking. And so now we want to do this in a much larger scale in a way uh, that we can truly understand which methods are most effective and for whom uh, on several thousand participants over the next few years. So it's really going to be combating stigma and helping people move towards treatment once they've been identified, it sounds like, is the next step with it. Yes, it, it, exactly. <laughs> it, it's it's uh, it tailored digital yeah. advancement strategies. That's what we're referring yeah. to them as uh, in order to encourage folks who are in the very early stages of help seeking to advance to that next stage. Yeah. Um, it, it's a long process. I mean, I, I, I think that often or initially we imagined that we would identify, assess and refer, and it would be a very quick and easy handshake, but it's not. Uh, and we need to think about how we can better dissect that pathway and support people throughout their journey from point A to point Z. It, it makes sense it'll be a journey because I was reading like cigarette packages now in, in many countries that just says smoking kills on it. Like it, the messaging is very clear people are still smoking. So part of it is having, identifying the risk and information is part of it, but that journey to get people to 
in smoke and quit, but in this case, begin to get a diagnosis, seek care, treatment is going to be hard, but it just makes so much sense. We have to invest in this ephemeral digital world and these pathways. I, I think, do you ever get that? Do you ever have a hard time not like, convincing people again? Because what we're talking about, we we notice where patients are, but you can't see it, right? You, you can't see the impact always of your outreach. Or do you get back to these numbers that make you excited that you can show people and get other states and teams excited to partner? Uh, so I would I would say in general there's a, an appreciation for the potential here, but it's also a, a big challenging task and it can be overwhelming. Uh, and it's hard to know exactly where to begin and also how to measure impact. Digital media yeah. campaigns have been going on for a long time, uh, and, and there are several very good ones uh, in, in mental health as well, but but it's not it's not enough to just measure engagement with a platform or likes or shares. We really have to get a, a consensus and, and an ability to, to measure clinically meaningful outcomes. And, and that's what I'm trying to do with this research is to build online um, platforms that can ultimately advance knowledge. But, but, uh, but that could be tricky. And we're also learning so many things and, and we're being surprised by certain things that we weren't expecting to learn about as we initially set out. So um, so I'd say, yes, it's, it's, it can be challenging to convince people, but uh, for the most part, I, I, I do believe that there's an understanding that there's a uh, potential benefit here and even a need. Y young people are online. That's not going away. And even if there's a black box warning on social media, young people are still going to figure out how to use it. Um, and yeah. so we can do our best to minimize that and reduce that and limit that. But the angle here is a little bit different. It's not really about stopping social media use. It's about using using aspects of social media that are good and helpful and beneficial to society. And, and how do we expand and enhance those um, and minimize the risks? Yeah. And I think especially in the fields that you and I work in treating people with serious mental illness, often defined as schizophrenia, bipolar, or severe depression, there's good evidence again for a lot of people, social media is a wonderful connection. They get peer support. There are good source of information. It, it's definitely not all bad, certainly. And I, I think we would be doing a misservice to everyone listening if we said it, it's, it's either or, but there definitely is benefit. But so few people are using it, as you said, to screen and reach people. We're talking about this debate, but the real debate is, yeah, this is where people are and we need to find them. And then, as you said, engaging people is hard. We've had webinars on just what does app engagement mean? What does digital health engagement mean? Can you even measure it, as you said? And if you can measure it, what is the impact? So you've taken this on to like expert double hard level at a population level. So it's a, it's a large undertaking. Before I open up to questions, for people listening, some of them are, are junior researchers, people who want to begin doing research in this field, how should people make a start? Or, or are there things they should read? Should they do? Should they find every paper you've read and read it? Probably not bad advice. I'll, I'll put that out there. <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate that. But I don't, I, I, I would say start, for me, it was finding, um, finding the right question. It was something that I was excited about and interested in. And I liked that it was a little bit different. Um, and um, and it resonated with me, but I also sought mentors, and and that's something that takes time. And for junior folks, I think that would be my biggest recommendation: is to identify folks in the field who are doing interesting, innovative things, and reach out uh, and get involved and learn as much as you can. And I think this, the, the rest kind of opens up. Uh, I never thought I would end up in this space, to be honest. I never thought I would even be a researcher. Uh, and somehow I'm here. And so I think it's just about being open and interested and eager uh, and exploring all opportunities. Um, and, uh, and they present themselves. And maybe one last question for me, then we'll open to audience questions. I, I know you're not speaking in your new role with the state of New York, but you are going to be leading up some early psychosis programs for New York, which is a very large state by geography or population. Are there any plans to integrate some of this technology parts or is that to be determined? 
I think that's beyond the scope of what I can say or even think about, given the fact that I've only been there for about three months. But I would <laughs> love to see. <laughs> I know there are states that are doing very large duration of untreated psychosis reduction campaigns. Um, yeah. Some of them have leveraged social media and the Internet to a certain extent. But I would love to see New York State do something like that or even the U.S. to do something like that and, and to really... Um, to, to, to really use social media and the internet, not just as a, as a side component, but as a core component of the way that we're going to address this challenge. Because I think yeah. ultimately it will boil down to how we're using the internet um, yeah. it, when we're thinking through uh, how to address that problem. It's really prevention you're talking about. Everyone else is talking about what do we do here and now and in Europe will say, look, this is where we're gonna find prevention and we need prevention if we're gonna solve the mental health crisis. But let me quickly get to some audience questions because we have some good, good ones. So this one says, why are there delays in getting appropriate treatment for the onset of, say, first symptoms of schizophrenia to, to having the illness? Sometimes, again, is we call it the duration of untreated psychosis or DUP. But how, why do we have these delays? It seems unnecessary. Yeah, I, I wish I wish they didn't exist. But and I think I, I know that there are a lot of different contributors to the delay. And I would say that everybody has a unique reason. Uh, and of course, there are some people who get help right away. But for the most part, what we know is that this is a, a, not just a national problem. It's really a global problem. Uh, the most recent report, I, I, I think that the, the, the median uh, amount of time that people were struggling with psychotic symptoms before they got help is 74 weeks. And so that is a huge amount of time. Yeah, for a lot of damage to happen. Wow. Um, as people disengage uh, from their friends and from work and from school and become preoccupied with symptoms that unfortunately get in the way of their goals and their dreams and their passions and who they want to be. Um, and so it's a, a combination of, of, of stigma, um, uh, of, of a lack of awareness about what to do and where to go, a lack of appreciation for what the symptoms might mean. Uh, and they also emerge in an interesting time and in, in, in development when adolescents um, and young adults are sort of evolving and changing. And sometimes I think uh, there can be um, uh, 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 the, the thought or the hope that maybe these experiences would go away and it doesn't need to escalate to the point of, of needing an actual psychiatrist uh, or a mental health counselor. And so those are just some of the reasons why, why people avoid care, but um, but that's something that is a really uh, gigantic question and, and and needs a lot of dedicated effort, additional dedicated effort. Yeah, and a related question is, is people are looking online, you're putting out high quality information, but this question says, how would you educate your patients about false information? I think I read about 80% information on TikTok around health is false or not true. Yeah. So I, I'd like to be there to combat the negative information that's out there. But yeah. I do talk to my participants and patients about the uh, th their experiences online. Um, and there are things that we can do together to sort of change that 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 uh, that experience. And sometimes it's a question of unfollowing certain people, uh, tinkering a little bit with the way that social media is providing uh, and delivering uh, other content to them by uh, by changing who they follow, changing what they like, following certain healthy role models, and having an open, uh, honest conversation with the young yeah. folks that I'm treating about the potential challenges of social media, uh, the stigma that they may experience, how they want to respond to that, uh, and how it makes them feel. I think all of the patients that we treat are experiencing this and going through it, um, and, and they can benefit from some guidance in terms of, uh, of how to manage the negative content that they are inevitably encountering online. Yeah. And I think you raise a good point is, as physicians, as clinicians, as leaders, of those of you listening interested, we need to be on these platforms too, spreading good information, right? It's, it's one thing to point out, but we, we have to, if, if there's bad information there, we can also post good information and, and be there. And I know some clinicians I know are very reticent to be on social media or to be active. And I do think that we, we do need to change that. And I think for all of you listening too, if you're interested in this, you can be posting good content and helping. We need to bring it into the room too. We often sort of assess yeah. outcome through social functioning and it's defined 
in these outdated terms for the most part. And I think, especially since COVID, where we've turned to virtual connectivity, uh, our social lives do not only exist offline. And there's important information that needs to be gathered and understood. And, and that is part that needs to be part of the care that we provide to, to our patients, understanding uh, and, and potentially even intervening in the way that they engage with their online universe. That makes sense. A, a different question is, are there any examples of your online campaigns? I know you always update them, you improve them so they come in ways, but are, are there any examples of those online campa campaigns people can read about or see or access to, to learn more? Yeah, so in in the papers that we have published, there should be there should be links uh, and um, and pictures of the campaign, so you uh, you can see the campaign. You could also click on the link. The websites become inactive uh, eventually once we're not using them, but we are in the middle of uh, starting a new one, which should be launching in the very near future. Um, and then there's uh, a mini one happening. Uh, currently at Northwell at, at Zucker for a program that we developed for folks at risk for developing psychosis. And we also have an existing campaign uh, collaborating with several early psychosis teams in Pennsylvania. And so those two are active um, and I'd be happy to distribute the links to those. They haven't been published yet, um, okay. but but uh, they're available online and, and you're more than welcome to have a look and feedback would be appreciated and welcome. We may include those links when we just post on the website if people want to see. Or again, what we'll think, because as I said, your campaigns come in waves. You improve off them and make them better. So it goes there. This is a, a hard question, but maybe just how, what are the best ways to keep people engaged online? I don't think anyone has the perfect answer, but do you have any top one or two strategies to keep people find a website, their campaign? How do you keep them going? Or what are the best nope. ways? Yeah, I so the it's it's tricky, um, and I would say that the way that we've been keeping people engaged to the best of our ability so far is by getting people off the internet and onto text, and so then ah. we have a text exchange with them, and we okay. we maintain the engagement through text. Most of the folks that we've identified, at least the way that we conceptualize it now, is they're on the internet for a very short amount of time. Most of them. Uh, are looking for information, potentially take a mental health screener and then bounce. And so we're trying, one of the things that we're hoping to do with this new phase of the research is to test strategies to get people uh, from a positive screen to picking up their phone and texting us or leaving contact information. That's one of our primary outcomes to see if we can get people from the internet to text. Uh, and, and, and what we know from prior work is that they'll maintain some level of engagement over text. Uh, and then of course, we wanna get them from texting to an actual assessment so that we can find out really what's going on. Uh, and there's a huge drop off there too. And so once again, we're hoping to test strategies over text to see if we can get people to that next level. Um, but to actually keep people online, I mean, that's really a question for social media because they do it beautifully. And if we can figure out how they keep people coming back for more, then that 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 would be really uh, an important next step for this research and other research as well. That's something we can learn from them. That's interesting about text. And Mary Sue has a related question. Has are, are there any other kind of things like that have surprised you? And I'll put in. We'll put in the chat. Mary Sue published some interesting papers with JMR on transmedia storytelling as a way to engage people in in mental health care. So we'll put the link there from her papers. But any other just things you're like, I would not have thought internet to text is the way to go. Any just other quick surprises you, you've seen as you do this work? Uh, so additional surprises that we haven't talked about today. I don't know if I have any gems to drop uh, at the moment. But, you uh, told us a lot already, though, so that's it's a that's a loaded, hard question to do. <laughs> that was a tough one to end with, yeah. <laughs> and I think maybe we'll go one last question, just kind of saying, is the ultimate goal of this research agenda to have people get a diagnosis, to find treatment? Where, where what is the what does success look like for this program that we'll keep expanding? For me, success would be getting folks into care as early as possible. Um, and so 
one of you know one of the I guess I get so I I do have a surprise. <laughs> Initially, <Ooh. laughs> we we were hoping to identify individuals with schizophrenia with early psych schizophrenia first episode psychosis we ended up identifying way more people who had um sub-threshold psychotic symptoms attenuated psychotic symptoms they were more appropriate uh for clinics who provide care for individuals with emerging symptoms rather than having a specific diagnosis and so that was a surprise we weren't necessarily expecting it but we think what happened is that we found people who were younger and earlier in the help seeking process. And uh -huh. the goal there, you know, the, the ultimate goal would be to get people as early as possible um, to identify that they need some support and also to provide a menu of interventions. You know, right now we're thinking, uh, looking for help online, assessment and care. But I think that most people don't want that. Uh, people are interested in apps. They're interested in self-help. They're interested in other forms and, and some things that we don't even know about just yet or maybe haven't been developed. But I think that there are opportunities to offer individuals who are looking for information support that isn't necessarily a typical clinic. Maybe it's peer support. Maybe it's done through an app. Maybe it's something entirely different. Uh, but I think that's a really important next step is to think through what people want and how to give them what they want while also... Uh, ensuring that they have access to higher levels of care if they need it. That makes sense. It's a novel way to screen and identify people. Maybe they want novel treatment approaches too. We're, we're not going to route everyone into the same box. Nor I'm can we. We might not be able to. That's true. We don't have enough psychiatrists or offices or people even of telehealth. I'm going to combine this one last comment and question that I promise for, for time will break. But this is a very nice one thing. Thank you, Dr. Brennenbaum. For a presentation of your work, I regularly present the results of your work in France, particularly the usage of advertising campaigns to refer patients in much earlier, simpler, and faster. For our national early intervention effort in France, we'd like to implement this type of campaign. Do you have recommendations or insights on how we kind of begin to build off or, or use aspects of your work and are these expensive campaigns to run? So I'm going to put those two together and I promise I'll be quiet. Yeah. That's it for me. Uh no, so so to answer your question, uh, I, I, I first of all thank you so much for saying that. Uh, it's really humbling uh, and um, and and really nice to hear. I I'm I love that there is interest in doing something like this, and I think uh, they can be expensive, um, and it really depends on the size and the scope of the campaign. Um, there are different ways to address costs in a variety of creative ways. And one of the ways, for example, that France can consider that we've considered in order to address cost uh, is partnering with existing nonprofits or online communities that already have a lot of traffic. So one of our biggest costs, for example, was developing a digital media campaign that consisted of ads that got people to click and come to our website. We developed a website. But uh, what we are doing now uh, or, and trying to do more is to collaborate with organizations that already have very busy websites. And so we don't need to spend that additional cost um, on advertisements. We also have to think about ways that we could address the cost of hosting the, the, the assessment process and the texting process is also uh, time consuming. And so we've thought a lot about different ways of automating that process uh, so that humans are involved, but they don't necessarily have to be the only ones involved. And so that's another way of, of, uh, of, of thinking through next steps and also curbing some of the costs that are associated with developing these campaigns that could be really big. So one, Michael, thank you for sharing so much. I think we got to most of the questions in it, but I think if if people find your papers, there's different ways to read. It's pretty easy to find your, your email address on the internet to learn more about well, these campaigns. <laughs> yes. And just to add, my email address has changed. Uh, so if oh, I don't true. respond, yeah, um, okay. then uh, I don't know if there's a better way to provide my contact information, but it is out there. Yeah. So, so and again, if people have questions, they can also just email us at JMIR, Side Digital Psychiatry, we can connect you. But I think 
you can just tell from the energy enthusiasm, this is a global national problem. And it's nice that you have a global national solution of social media to kind of do something completely different, innovative, and move towards prevention. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Thank you to our audience for all the questions and listening in. And we'll be back next month with a different one. So thank you and goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.